welcome to a series of podcasts where I talk about all the albums I've never heard. Here I'll discuss as many legendary albums as I can think of and give my thoughts and opinions on them. I'm your host, Aaron Rose, and without further ado, enjoy the show. Rockabilly is a genre usually characterized by minimalist production, often consisting of an upright bass, an electric guitar, and cut time drums. This genre was incredibly prominent in the mid-50s, usually produced by Sam Phillips at the Sun Record Studios. Elvis and Jerry Lee Lewis all recorded in this genre, but there is another person who recorded rockabilly, and arguably is one of the most influential figures in country music. This person was Johnny Cash. Even people who say they don't like country usually admit that they like Johnny Cash. He was huge in the 50s, and even through the 60s. However, after a few decades of enjoyed popularity, his sales started to fall, and throughout the 70s and 80s he struggled hard with finding an audience. This, compounded with intense substance abuse, would seem to ensure that Johnny Cash would never see the light of day again, and forever be seen as a washed-up artist who was huge once and fell from grace quickly. However, Johnny Cash had one final trick up his sleeve. He signed to a new record label, and Rick Rubin was assigned to produce his next album. The label gave him pure creative control, and Johnny Cash recorded a series of acoustic covers of songs, folk and not, along with some songs he wrote himself, either re-recorded or not. The naming scheme was simple. The album title would follow the name of the label. Thus, in 1994, Johnny Cash released American Recordings. The album was universally praised on launch and made several polls for the greatest album of that year, as well as making the Rolling Stones list of the 500 greatest albums of all time at 334. Three more albums in this vein would be released in Johnny Cash's lifetime, as well as two after his death. So, is the album worth the commotion? Well, let's talk about American Recordings by Johnny Cash. Why is it legendary? Now, of course, this entire podcast is meant to cover legendary albums, so what's so legendary about this one? Well, it showed that the legendary Johnny Cash wasn't done. He brought attention to a lot of songs, both old and new, and brought attention to a new acoustic style of music. It also represents an artist given total creative freedom over what they wanted to do. It was a fairly rare practice in 1994, but since then, the music industry has started to let up a little. American Recordings is mainly legendary for those reasons. Now, each song is an acoustic song, so I can't pull a musical analysis out for every one, as most of them have the same basic instrumentation. However, the lyrics tend to be something special, and those will be what I'm focusing on this episode. 1. Delia's Gone Delia's Gone is a cover of a traditional song that was actually recorded by Johnny Cash in the 60s. It was likely written about the murder of a girl called Delia Green, who was a young African-American woman who was killed in 1900. This immediately sets the tone of the album by being an acoustic song that's driven by acoustic guitar. It has a sorrowful feeling about it, with the lyrics clearly describing the murderer wanting to marry Delia, if only he hadn't shot her. The verses tell a story of this murderer showing remorse over doing the deed. However, he also seems a little on edge, because he swears he can still hear Delia walking around at his bedside at night in the jail cell. Whatever the case, he seems to end by telling people that if you have a devilish woman, like Delia allegedly was, you can either let her go or kill her yourself. Well, that's a bit of a binary. The song itself is still very good. 2. Let the Train Blow the Whistle This song was written by Johnny Cash and is another acoustic composition. This one's a little faster and swung, which implicates a train chugging along. This is the first of many gospel songs on American recordings. Johnny Cash was an incredibly devout Christian, and this is notable in a lot of his songs, starting with this one. Let the train blow the whistle seems to describe a metaphorical train to heaven. It's a bit of a brag, even. Johnny Cash tells the gossipers and liars, i.e. sinners, that'll see them in the fire. However, that's not the basis of this song. Let the train blow the whistle seems to be Johnny Cash finally accepting that someday he'll be happy in heaven despite how he lived what with the substance abuse and whatnot. The train is blowing the whistle because Johnny Cash is prepared to go, and even after the life he lived, the gift of heaven is still pretty close by. It's a good song, certainly, and that acceptance makes it that much sweeter when applied to a guy who has clearly had his problems but is willing to work on them and go to heaven. 3. The Beast in Me This song's much slower and dour, but fitting of its title. Originally written by one of Johnny Cash's stepson-in-laws, Nick Lowe, it clearly describes the idea of being a sinner. It's another gospel-inspired song. Contrasting with Let the Train Blow the Whistle, this song definitely focuses on a different aspect of being a sinner. While yes, all your sins will be forgiven, that doesn't mean you can just be whoever you want. The idea behind being a Christian is all about recognizing that you aren't a perfect person. Just as God is inside all of us, so is the devil, and you'll have to restrain that beast sometimes. 
the entire song is focusing on the volatile nature of this beast and how it can pop up whenever and wherever, so you have to keep an eye on it. Basically, just don't be a bad person to the best of your ability. Not my favorite song on this album, but it clearly means a lot to Johnny Cash, and at the end of the day, that's what this entire album is about. 4. Drive On This one's also swung. It's written by Cash, and it talks about serving in the army and being a veteran. A Vietnam one, specifically, with PTSD it seems. The song introduces two other vets from the Vietnam War, who are friends of our main singer. We've got Whiskey Sam and Tex. Whiskey Sam specifically was stuck in Vietnam for 25 years before our protagonist saw him again. However, it's noted that Whiskey Sam did come back, which was better than not coming back at all. The protagonist notes that he saw many good men fall, and that it still haunts him to this day. However, he pays it no mind, just trying to live a normal life without being haunted by these memories. The next verse establishes Tex, who was set up as a great friend to our protagonist, but unfortunately died due to a mortar shell that hit the protagonist and Tex from just 20 feet away. The protagonist survived, and carries shrapnel to this day, but Tex did not. This appears to have a profound effect on our protagonist, who is practically frightened out of his mind with all the things he can't forget. Every time he wants to escape, his memory pulls him back to Vietnam, with the jungles and the deaths. However, the story ends on a hopeful note, with the last verse stating that the protagonist got a letter from Whiskey Sam telling him that he's a miracle in his own way. It's a very powerful song and it tells a great story. While plenty of songs about the Vietnam War exist, this does not diminish the value of any of them. 5. Why Me Lord This one's a slower one, which melds spoken word vocals with normal singing. Originally written by Chris Christopherson, Why Me Lord takes the layout of a prayer, with Cash asking God what he's done to deserve the blessings he gets. It goes back to the idea of the beast inside us. Again, nobody is a perfect being, and asking God for help is common practice. Johnny Cash spins this song basically just asking God to help him in his life. While he didn't have much life after this, it's never too late to ask for help. It's a solemn song, and one that's as simple in lyricism as it is fantastic in execution. 6. 13. Written by Glenn Danzig, 13 is led by an almost punk-like acoustic guitar pattern. It's almost as different stylistically as you can get from the rest of this album on an acoustic guitar. If you've ever heard of the fanfiction slash story, Fallout Equestria Project Horizons, one look at my YouTube profile picture and this should not surprise you, this song reminds me a lot of the main character of that story, Blackjack, at least what I know of her. This entire song is about a person who's so terribly unlucky that just being around them is a bad omen. Considering that Blackjack has a red and black mane, and she's from literally Stable 13, having bad luck is her specialty. The songwriting is surprisingly metal for this album, and it really shows how bad being around 13 can be. All the lyricism really melds together to create this character very well. While I may not have a lot to say about it, 13 is easily my favorite song on this album. 7. Bury Me Not on the Lone Prairie Introduction, A Cowboy's Prayer This song is very slow and almost peaceful. It's a classic cowboy folk song, and it's another song in a gospel style with gospel lyricism. This song is pretty simple. It takes the form of a prayer delivered almost entirely in a spoken word style accompanied by Johnny Cash's very simple guitar patterns. Well, it appears that way at first, and then it's suddenly revealed at the end that this was a cowboy's dying prayer. He asks God to keep him alive, as he's seen so much and has so much to live for, but that unfortunately doesn't pan out. At the end, it switches to being sung as the other cowboys revealed what they did with the body. They buried him on the lone prairie, in a shallow grave before continuing on with their lives. It's a solemn reminder that deaths can come for you at any point, and to live your life the best you can. 8. Bird on the Wire Originally written by Leonard Cohen, this song is very slow and rather regretful. While Leonard Cohen was very much an all-purpose songwriter who didn't really have any religious affiliation, and this song from his pen reads more as a genuine connection to someone human, someone who Cohen had a great deal of respect for and someone he loved very much. However, when sung by Johnny Cash, this song takes on a more obvious gospel feel, with Cash singing about God, as he has on many times on the album. This song once again touches on the themes of the album so far, about how Johnny Cash isn't perfect and how he's deeply resentful of all his sins. He's talking to God, asking if he's been unfaithful and hopefully not to him. While not penned by Cash, the lyrics at the end, I saw a young man leaning on his crutch, he called out to me, don't ask for so much, and a young woman leaning on her door, she cried out to me, hey, why not ask for more? 
also add another layer to this song. How the most desperate never want to inconvenience anybody, and how those who have everything in the world usually want more. It adds to the song by putting Johnny Cash in the middle and prepared to make his own choice by putting his trust in God to lead him on his way. It's a very good song. 9. Tennessee Stud Originally written by Jimmy Driftwood, this song is led by a guitar part heavily inspired by the oompa bass lines of several old country songs. This song is also unique because it was recorded live in Los Angeles at a nightclub, so you can hear the audience reacting to the song as Johnny Cash is playing it, and I feel like it greatly adds to this song. Tennessee Stud is about a young man and his horse, aptly called the Tennessee Stud, going on adventures throughout the U.S. The song covers some of the protagonist's exploits, most involving his sweetheart's uncle being an outlaw, so the protagonist travels through trying to take down her uncle. When he eventually does so, he finds a beautiful maiden with golden hair, presumably his sweetheart, and a mare of her own, so he returns home with her and eventually gets with her and their horses get together too. It's a pretty enjoyable song, and I feel like the audience adds to it quite nicely, mainly because it definitely feels like Johnny Cash is telling an old story in an old nightclub, which makes the song really stand out. While not my favorite song on the album, it's definitely a good one. 10. Down There by the Train Written by Tom Waits, the guitar behind this song plays very nicely on the low strings, with some chords being played during a couple of choruses and periodic bursts of energy. Another gospel song, Down There by the Train, describes a hypothetical train where sinners can be washed of their sins so long as they believe. The type of sinners Cash described in this song range from people like Judas and John Wilkes Booth and even the soldier that pierced Jesus' side. But of course, this being a Johnny Cash song, the final verse describes how he's also part of this legion of sinners and how he'll be going to that train too, to be forgiven. Down There by the Train concludes with a burst of energy where Johnny Cash becomes confident in being down by the train and how it's a path to being forgiven. It's another good song, and the changes in the acoustic guitar during it greatly add to the uniqueness and message of the song, and I enjoy it very much. 11. Redemption. This song is written by Cash, and it has a certain sound to it that sounds almost medieval and a little exotic. It's a simple bass and guitar pattern, but it certainly sounds unique. It's another gospel one about how God and Jesus save Cash when he feels down and tempted. The song discusses the blood of Jesus and how it gives Cash life, and how it gives others life as well. It makes a lot of comparisons to the tree of life, and how a vine that sprawls down it is likely Jesus is doing. There isn't actually too much to the song. It's a very empowering song about trusting in God to save you. While your opinion may vary, I personally like the message and very much like the song. 12. Like a Soldier Written by Johnny Cash, this song has a bouncy feeling to it. This song is another gospel-influenced song, with Cash clearly talking about God in this one. This song basically consists of Cash telling God that he saved Cash. Cash brings up how he feels like a soldier and how somebody, but likely God, has saved him and how he now puts his trust into them. This drives home the very religious Cash's stance about God being one of the things that should matter the most in life. Another great part of this song is that Cash makes it very clear he's always looking forward. He says that each day is better than the one before, and just like a soldier, he is going to keep marching on. It's a nice song, and another great one on the album. 13. The Man Who Couldn't Cry Written by Loudon Wainwright III, Cash's take consists of an almost bluesy feeling. This song was also recorded at the same nightclub as Tennessee Stud, and as such, you can hear the audience. However, what was a big benefit for Tennessee Stud makes the man who couldn't cry almost grating to listen to. The song itself has a very simple idea. There's a certain man who is said never cried, even when he went through the worst days of his life, these being described as a series of incredibly bad events, and even through all that, he didn't cry a single tear. After this man goes to jail, he continues being completely unable to cry, and experts are brought in to try and see what's wrong with him. They all conclude that he's a crazy person and an insensitive beast. Somehow. Don't know how you make that conclusion, but this song still has story to tell. In response, they pick him up and throw him in a mental hospital. He makes friends there, and he's noted to have started crying, but only when it rains. But one time it just started raining, and it continued raining for 40 days and nights. So the man cries for, well, 40 days and nights, and ends up dying due to dehydration. In response, everyone who wronged him gets their just desserts. This ends by the song mentioning that the jail burned down and the earth suffered perpetual drought. It has a good message. 
Don't make fun of people for things they can't control, but the story seems to be missing out on a few parts. I can't knock Cash for that, as he didn't write the song, and it does fit him well in all fairness. However, what does do the song a disservice is the audience. Cash is trying to tell this incredibly sad story about a man who couldn't cry, and the audience laughs at him. They laugh at the song, this man completely taking away from the message of this song. It would have been nice if at the end the audience laughs got progressively thinner because they were being taken out by the vengeful spirit of this man for laughing at him, which would keep to the message of the song. However, this being a live audience, you can't control that and absolutely nothing happens to them. Without the audience, the man who couldn't cry would have been way better. The rest of the album is great, it's, it's just this particular song I don't really like. Outro. So, does American Recordings deserve to be legendary? Yes, it absolutely does. While it may not be as good as Recordings 5 or Recordings 4, when Cash started to make more songs to sync, the classic American Recordings is a very good album. It showed that Johnny Cash still had a lot of fight in him, and what could happen when artists got full creative control. The amount of songs we contextualized in Cash's own way, and how much heart he put into them, it's what an album that's mostly covers should be. While it may not be the most legendary legendary album, it allowed people to strip back a legendary star and reveal what they'd constantly felt, and it deserves to be called one of the best albums of all time. American Recordings by Johnny Cash deserves to be called a legendary album. This has been Aaron Rose, and thanks for listening.